Okay, well, good afternoon, everyone. See, I, I walk with energy and it makes people happy. It makes people smile. So, once and for all, a very, very big welcome to all of you to the session. And even before I begin, can we say a very, very big thank you to the Epoch Consortium for having us here. It is a real pleasure to be here and we hope that this session is incredibly informative and enjoyable. So, before I begin, I need to do a very, very quick check. So, how many hands am I holding up at the moment? Good, one hand. How many fingers? How many now? How many now? Excellent. So when I'm doing the timekeeping and I'm reminding people how much time they have, everyone can see me. Great. So we have a very, very interesting saying in the UK, which is that a rising tide floats all boats. And we usually use this quote to speak about the economy and this idea that actually, if you have an economy which is working, then potentially as it grows, maybe it's going to be growing for everybody. But from a practical sense, we know that this isn't always the case and it doesn't always feel as though a growing economy is going to benefit all people. Maybe this is because of infrastructure. Maybe this is because of the way education and training works. Maybe this is because of actually the business environment. Actually, there are a wide variety of reasons why that experience doesn't necessarily translate to all people. And what we're very, very interested in as a department, the Department for Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, is creating an economy and an environment within the UK where all people are able to benefit from growth, ben able to benefit from the policies that we put forward. And really, really interesting in p being able to pursue that is understanding this idea that we live in a world that is not only interconnected, but incredibly complex. And in order to really fully understand the challenges that we are facing, we are going to need a wide variety of people to understand the different challenges that we face whether th these be philosophical, whether these be political, whether these be in the technology space, or actually whether these relate to the economy. And so on that basis, we're very, very proud to have in front of you a wide range of experiences as we really take on some of these challenges and really explore today how it is that some, we can approach some of these. And so, without wasting any further more of your time, I'm going to very, very happily at this point introduce you to our first speaker who is going to be Hugo Bussell. Now he is a policy advisor in the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy and he's going to be giving you a quick overview of the industrial strategy. So on that basis, ladies and gentlemen, Hugo. Thank you, Horatio. So yes, yeah, so I work in the international team in the industrial strategy. Directorate, as a disclaimer, I'm, I'm a generalist. I look at the whole of the industrial strategy. So if you ask me a question about the strategic priorities fund or, or something along those lines later on, I would, I'll do my best to answer it, but I have an overall view of the, of the whole thing. So I'm just gonna give you a quick 10 minute overview of the industrial strategy before I kind of pass over to Esther and Emma on the um, kind of the juicy and more interesting bits. Not so the industrial strategy is not interesting, it is. It's, it's wonderful. Um, but just to give you a little bit of context, so in the UK, as you can see on that slide, we have a, we have a major issue in terms of productivity. Uh, productivity has been stagnating for the last kind of 10 years. If you, um, for example, asked Andy Haldane, chair of the Bank of England, and also chair of our Industrial Strategy Council, he would say it's kind of the number one issue facing the UK at the moment. Um, and there it is. Uh, uh, but it's also good to emphasize that this is not a problem that the UK alone is, is facing. Um, and with that in mind, um, across the world, you're seeing these kind of industrial strategies popping up all, all over the place, um, mainly in Europe and, and Asia Pacific, but even in, in, in South America, for example, um, I know that Mexico and Chile are now looking at their own industrial strategies. Colombia has developed a really interesting idea around creative industries in the orange economy. Um, uh, and yeah, China, Korea, uh, Japan, Singapore as well have all got developed their own industrial strategies. Um, but they're all slightly different. They have different nuances and, and emphasis. Um, so we developed our industrial strategy in 2017. It was announced in November 2017. Um, and it seeks to kind of build on our strengths. We're very innovative. We have a really good research base, really good place to start up, uh, kind of start businesses. We attract a lot of investment in the UK. So it was how can we use those strengths um, and use them to kind of solve our weaknesses and, and establish this long-term plan for the, for the economy. Um, and we decided to have kind of adopt this three-pronged approach, I would say, recognizing that 
productivity is a is a complex issue. There's not a single kind of linear solution, as I imagine you you know. Uh, and the three kind of building blocks were the foundations, um, sector deals, and, and, and the grand challenges. So I'm just going to run you through each all three of those to explain them. Uh, so the first kind of and the key aspect, I said, kind of the meat um, of it, are the five foundations, um, which kind of encapsulate all activity across across the the UK economy. Those are ideas. Um, so kind of research, innovation, commercialization of research, people, um, from just when you're at school to, to when you're an adult um, in terms of skills, and uh, but also kind of the working environment, uh, infrastructure, business environment, and places. And this is kind of, we've got this kind of broad categorization because in order to solve productivity, th there are lots of kind of potential issues that you have to face. So for, exa for, for example, the idea is how much are we investing in research and development um, for people? Do kind of does the UK population do we have the right skills in terms of sciences, STEM skills uh, for those jobs uh, in the, in a kind of a future-facing advanced economy? In terms of infrastructure, are we investing in large-scale um, infrastructure projects to kind of improve that connectivity, not just digitally um, and physically, but also in terms of kind of a more kind of clean growth economy? Um, business environment. So, do we have good management practices? Um, it's a kind of a, a big issue that the UK has struggled with in the past. Uh, and finally, what about the spread of, of productivity and, and economic growth? Um, for example, in, in London, um, really good productivity, but if you look outside of London, um, it's it kind of it, that's where some of the issues appear. So, um, how can we ensure that we? Um, I suppose this industrial strategy was developed to ensure that that economic growth is spread across the country. Um, and as a result, in those five foundations, I think. We have about 170 odd policies. I don't know. I think 200, 200, we'll say 200, 200 policies. Um, so it, it, it's massive. Uh, it's a whole of government project. Um, kind of almost every every single government department is involved in, in implementing these kind of foundation policies, um, barring I think Ministry of the Ministry of Justice. Um, so kind of a few headline ones. Um, for ideas, we established an industrial strategy challenge fund, bringing together business to encourage innovation. Uh, people, uh, how can we improve our technical education through key levels? Uh, infrastructure, uh, so f for example around um, 5G, um, that's, a, that's a headline policy. Uh, business environment, so how are we making our SMEs, our small and medium enterprises more productive in terms of places? How are we helping uh, local regions in the UK to understand what are their strengths? What do they need to do to, to kind of contribute to the overall growth of the economy? And we're doing that through our local industrial strategies. Um, so those are the five, five foundations, the building blocks of the industrial strategy. But looking, and I suppose this is a really important aspect of the industrial strategy, the sector deals are all about working with, with businesses in specific sectors. And if you, for example, look back at the 2012 industrial strategy under, under Vince Cable when he was Secretary of State of Biz, um, they chose specific sectors to focus on and work with based on economic analysis. Um, with the sector deals, <laughs> it's kind of a... Okay, we want to work with sectors from across the economy, but in order for us to work with you, you need to unify, um, develop kind of a sense of um, identity as a sector, and come to us with a proposal. What do you want as a sector from government, and we'll work with you. Um, and so each of these sector deals combine, kind of have commitments from industry, but also from government, and it sets out a long-term vision for that sector. So often the government will commit some money, um, uh, the sector will kind of commit to things around diversity inclusion, um, but also things like apprenticeships, etc. So these are, I think so far we have agreed 11 of them. There's no theoretical limit, um, but they're all based on the sector coming together and, and making these unified proposals to government, and then we have a dialogue with them, and you agree these kind of long-term strategies for the sector. Um, and the third uh, part is the, and these are kind of the, the catchy, this is kind of the popular part of the industrial strategy, the grand challenges. So these are kind of global challenges facing the world, uh, acknowledging that the world is changing in fundamental ways and we need to adapt to that and take advantage of those opportunities. And we chose four grand challenges, um, AI and data, clean growth, an aging society and the future of mobility. And those are not the only grand challenges, there are other ones around kind of cyber security or, or food. Um, but we kind of picked these because we felt that that's what we had kind of this we had, we, where we felt the biggest opportunities for the UK were and where we kind of felt we had the best kind of strengths to build on. Um, there you go. But you may know, and, uh, and this is a common kind of comment, that the 
grand challenges that are hugely kind of broad. You say, okay, you wanna, you're gonna be at the forefront of these industries, AI and data, what does that mean? Uh, <laughs> That, that, that could be a huge, I mean, AI can, is related to so many different sectors across the entire economy. So to provide it with a little bit of definition, we have introduced missions, and there are five so far. Um, there could be more. Um, to kind of, I suppose, provide some guidance to industry and research and kind of academic institutions. So this is where we'd like to focus on for now. Um, so for example, on AI and data, using AI for early diagnosis or aging society. How can we create a better kind of add to make sure people can enjoy five extra healthy years, years of independent living. Um, and those are supported through, through um, kind of various funds, etc. cetera. Um, I think that's all I'm gonna say on, on, on kind of generally outlining the other strategy. And I think I'm gonna hand back to a ratio to introduce Emma and Esther. Thank you, big round of applause for Hugo. Thank you. Brilliant. And in the introductory speech, we mentioned how we are living in a very complex and interconnected world, and actually embracing diversity of thought is incredibly important. And in our next segment, I'm going to be introducing to you two speakers who are going to be speaking to us about diversity in the workplace, but moreover, diversity and inclusion in the industrial strategy. So the two speakers that I'd like to introduce to you are one, Emma Green, who is Head of Diversity and Inclusion at the Department of Business, Energy and Industrial Strategy, and Industrial Strategy, sorry, as well as uh, our next speaker, who is an incredible, incredible speaker, who is Esther Kwan, who is, <laughs> who is the Head of Infrastructure Foundations. Please, a big round of applause for both. Um, thank you very much. Um, so just to, just to really manage your expectations, I know absolutely nothing about econo economics. I can't even say it properly. So, um, but I am very good at diversity and inclusion. So um, I'll try and help you uh, the best I can with the knowledge that I do have. And then Esther is going to take you through a very fascinating, um, I suppose, merging of the two together with the industrial strategy and how that works with diversity and inclusion. So um, in, in, in summary, what I do um, as a role within government is to try and make sure that as uh, an organisation that serves the public, we do so to the best of our ability, to the fullest of the public. So that means all different types of people in the public. That means different people from different backgrounds. That means different ethnicities, different social class. That means different uh, sexual orientation, gender, disability, all of those kinds of things. And obviously all of those things are impacted by um, e economics. So um, for us, it's really, really important to be bearing this in mind in terms of our policies. So in a lot of organisations, we think mainly about what does diversity and inclusion mean to us in terms of our, um, our staff and our working culture? I know that varies throughout different countries in Europe, um, how much of a focus certain organisations have on that. But to us in the UK, we think it's really important that the people we have working in an organisation represent the people we're trying to serve, um, not least out of principle, but because it helps us to make better decisions. So I'm going to go through a bit of that now, um, and then Esther will kind of cover the, the, the more exciting detail afterwards. So in Bayes, we have kind of a, a mission or an ambition, if you like, um, around um, embedding uh, a truly inclusive culture. So when we talk about inclusion, we don't just mean not discriminating against people. Being inclusive is very much a verb. It's something we do. It's something that requires you to be active in engaging with difference. Um, and what we try and do with that in Bayes is make sure that where there are differences of ideas and experiences, we include them within decision making. Because um, as you, you might be aware, there's plenty of issues where you get group think, which is this idea where everybody thinks the same, and therefore issues will not be picked up on a, um, at the time of decision making, and um, things will happen, which mean that mistakes have been made, which could have been picked up by having a different um, difference of people in the room. And this is very much the same for policy development as well, and, um, and and deciding on uh, things that affect countries. So there are three reasons we do diversity and inclusion at Bayes, or just broadly within government. There's a legal case, so how many of you have heard of the Equality Act? 
<laughs> the two. <laughs> so um, it's actually a very progressive piece of legislation, um, although it could be better, within the UK, which protects people against certain protected characteristics like ethnicity, disability, those kinds of things. You're protected against discrimination under the law in those cases. And for public organisations, that means we also have to take uh, an extra step, which is to ensure that our decision-making, our policies, and the things that we do for the public do not discriminate. And not only do they not discriminate, but they actively um, bring people um, uh, closer together. So that's the legal case. We have to do it. So when we're thinking about our policies, we have to show that we've done something called give due regard to making sure we're trying to reduce discrimination for those groups of people. Um, protected characteristics are up there as well, so age, disability, all those kinds of things. Then there's the moral case. We like to think it's the right thing for us to do. You know, we're a public organisation. Um, we don't join the civil service for the pay, believe it or not. Um, we usually join because we're trying to do the right thing for the world. Um, so actually for a lot of us, it's really important morally to do stuff on diversity and inclusion. And then the business case, which is the thing I suppose we're focusing on more here and something that Esther will go into in more detail. For us, it's not just about doing it because it's a good idea and because it helps to include people and because it's nice. We do it because it does actually and has been repeatedly proven within business to make organisations more effective. Um, it not only makes people feel more able to work for an organisation, it makes them feel more included, it makes them more productive um, and it makes organisations make better decisions and to the point where it's even been proven that um, you know uh, people will price stocks and shares more correctly when they're in a more diverse team. So there are real, real tangible impacts um, here. So in terms of our main focus, we think about this in terms of innovation. So for us, innovation is a huge part of um, the industrial strategy and the work that we do um, as, as a government as well. For us, innovation comes from a difference of opinion and a difference of ideas being brought together and being able to be discussed in one place. So diversity and inclusion for us isn't just about not discriminating against people. It's about understanding if someone has a different background, a different experience, a different set of ideas, we should be including that within policy making. Um, and we already know within, within the UK government at least, um, the Government Economic Service is currently conducting research into gender diversity and how that can affect economic practice and policy making. So this is a really live issue for us in government. Um, there's also stuff that suggests that lots of, re this is just one example, but there's lots of research that suggests that um, female economists exhibit less ide ideological bias and are more able to set aside biases when dealing with an issue they'd personally experienced than male economists. So, and that, uh, that's just not, that's not something I've just picked out the air, that's something that has been uh, has been looked at within research. I heard, I heard a bit of chuckling there, so I'm, I wonder whether there's going to be a bit of just debate on that afterwards. Um, but I thought this, this quote was really interesting. So ideological biases make the economics profession ill-equipped to engage in balanced debates regarding politically controversial economic issues that characterise our time, such as inequality, austerity and climate change. So it's really worth bearing in mind that um, economics isn't, for in, in the sense of diversity and inclusion, isn't just about the impact that you have on people, but it's about how you decide the things that you're deciding upon in the first place when you're thinking about um, economics um, and who's in the room when those decisions are made or who's involved. So for us um, at Bayes, that we've got an example. It's, it's not. Um, it's not to do with um, economics specifically, but thinking about our claim climate change work that we're doing at the moment, here's an extract of how we've started to include this within policy making. Um, so um, what they've done is created this statement that everybody needs to be aware of within the teams who are creating policy so that they'll use that when they're considering how to create that policy. Um, so here it says everyone will be affected by climate change and everyone needs energy. Everyone will benefit from cleaner air and a healthier natural environment. The global citizens most impacted by um, ICE action are populations comprising people of colour, so that might be people from different ethnicities in the kind of language that we use. Within this group, the most systema systematically marginalised are poor women, disabled people, the youngest and the oldest and other minority groups, yet international decisions, especially those dis shaping international energy system, are dominated by men. International climate and energy policy and action in the UK can be best delivered by recognising the global citizens most affected. And I think that's absolutely equally applicable to e economics as well. So that's kind of just my quick spiel on how we, how we view diversity and inclusion within our department in government. Uh, hopefully that will help to give you a bit of context to what Esther's going to say next.
Hi, everyone. Um, I'll try to make it interesting um, and dialectical because um, obviously you don't want to be talked at the whole time. So if there's any sort of questions um, that arise uh, during my presentation, do just sort of raise your hand and very happy to take your questions then. So I'm going to talk about how we're actually putting this into practice when we are doing policy making. And a specific example that I'm going to use is the industrial strategy, which I'm based in. Um, but I just want to give you sort of um, an uh, sort of overview in terms of like my talk. So I'm going to first give you like the context behind why we should do diversity inclusion in policy making um, and the sort of government policies and sort of targets that we have and obviously a lot of questions for you all actually because we want to capitalize on the fact that you're academics and oftentimes we want to bridge that sort of academia and policy making world making sure that there is that sort of knowledge diffusion taking place um, so without further ado um, the context so as Hugo alluded to earlier there is a long-standing productivity issue in the UK and it has definitely definitely been exacerbated in recent years, especially post-2007 um, with the financial crisis. We just have not seen the same sort of um, uptake um, to increases in productivity that as our sort of uh, international peers. And interestingly too, and Hugo also touched upon this point when he talked about the Places Foundation, is the fact that the UK has a very regionally imbalanced economy in the sense that there are very significant sort of um, inequalities um, within the regions of the United Kingdom. And so um, the sort of divergence uh, goes everything from the sort of productivity performances to the sort of um, what we call the socioeconomic indicators, um, such as e educational sort of attainment. And um, just wanted to point out that uh, you might have heard in the news, uh, the sort of um, UK, uh, a lot of the announcements that are done by our ministers and also whenever there are sort of House of Commons debates and select committee hearings, a lot of the discussions around these sort of rural and coastal sort of peripheries um, in the UK that are really struggling to keep up with places such as London and the sort of self of England in terms of their sort of productivity performances. And so why I want to capture that sort of context is because um, at the end of the day, we're just essentially not fully tapping into the human um, capital of the UK. And as you all know, human capital, and I'm not an economist, just as a disclaimer, um, but from Economics 101, uh, human capital is key to the functioning of the economy. And if we cannot utilize our human capital efficiently, then we're never going to solve this sort of productivity issue that we have in the country. Um, so. I'm not going to go through uh, the slide again because Hugo has done a very good job in terms of outlining the sort of UK's economic strategy going forward in terms of how we're going to address this productivity uh, puzzle. Um, but essentially, I just want to reiterate that um, you know the industrial strategy's aim is to essentially boost productivity and increase the earning power of people throughout the entire country. And when you read that sort of like um, statement, you got to think, well, obviously we need to target policies. Um, um, to those who are actually left behind, those who are marginalized, those who are disadvantaged the most, right? Um, and so that is essentially where um, Emma's team and I come in, and that is because policymaking is quite, um, I don't know, actually, before I go on in this, has, has anybody in this room had any sort of public sector experience? Okay, great, perfect. So, I, well, actually, I'm not gonna sort of like preach then, since there are some certain individuals in whom who might have more experience than I do in this area. But you know, and I want to have the sort of like open discussion about this. So, one of the some of key issues, and you don't have to be in the public sector to sort of figure this out. But one of the some of the key issues in terms of like the policy making process, in terms of incorporating that sort of diversity and inclusion angle into policy making process. What are some guesses? What are some of the struggles, I guess? Anybody? It's okay, there are no wrong answers. Everybody can. <laughs> what are some of the sort of, I guess, like obstacles that people sort of like come across? Like as policy, yes, at the back. So you're saying, 
<laughs> no, but uh, no, I appreciate that answer. So, so you're saying that, like, basically, if you mix sort of like policies to correct uh, sort of injustice of the past now, it is unequal because uh, you are dis positively discriminating against certain groups. Right. Okay, yeah. Th there, yeah, there is certain pushback. Yeah, that is very true. So that is not an incorrect answer. Yes, that's definitely a very real pushback. Yes. Yep, yep, that is very much uh, key, yep. Uh, in terms of, you know, as a public service, you know, you're s literally trying to steer a massive ship. <laughs> and, you know, trying to change course often takes um, quite a lot of effort and relentlessness. Yes, exactly, yeah, and there's... Uh, Right, exactly, yeah, so I guess everybody comes from a particular sort of like, you know, background with our own sort of like blind spots, biases, um, yep, 100%, yeah, what else? Yes, at the back. Okay, yeah, in terms of representation, yeah, for sure. I think, you know, something that Emma picked up on earlier, yeah, 100%. So we all know the answers to how we could solve, like, this whole DNI sort of issue in industrial strategy. Great. Um, so, uh, no, but uh, jokes aside, it's definitely, those issues are very live in the civil service, and I've worked in the Canadian government before joining the UK civil service, and I could say that, yes, it is definitely all those issues and more. Um, but, you know, as policymakers, I think, you know, once you have that sort of recognition that you know your policies actually make a massive difference, massive impact on those um, your constituents. Essentially, you are incumbent. It's incumbent upon the civil servants to take that sort of diversity and inclusion lens in their policy making to ensure that the policies actually deliver on the objectives um, that the government has set out for itself. And in the case of the industrial strategy, I think we have quite a strong case um, for employing that diversity and inclusion lens because effectively when you go back to that sort of, you know, the objectives of it, boost productivity, well, how do you do that? You have to target your policies to those who are underperforming, right? Um, and increase earning power of people throughout the entirety of the UK. It's not just, you know, people who are well off, but you know, entirety of everybody. So that includes those who are left behind, so to speak. So um, it's uh, definitely very key. And this is something that, um, you know, increasingly we're gaining a bit of traction um, within the civil service um, to ensure that all the sort of 200 plus policies within the industrial strategy actually take into consideration that sort of diversity and inclusion lens when we go about that policy making process. And I should also note that um, the UN SDGs, this is also a very sort of live issue for us and we want to make sure that um, the UK can actually deliver on our ambitions on that front too. Um, so the case for change, I think these are not unfamiliar figures for um, people in the room here. Um, and But just, you know, some sort of headline figures I've pulled out. Um, definitely a representation issue when it comes to senior management. Um, as some of you have already um, said and noted, um, in terms of ethnic minorities, when it comes to their sort of representation in management positions, that's also a very, um, uh, it's quite a, a stark sort of number, 6% versus uh, I think the um, ethnic minority population in the UK is around 13. So, um, and uh, I'm not gonna go through the entire list, but you know, essentially through all the different sort of protected characteristics that uh, Emma has outlined, all of these groups um, face sort of um, multiple disadvantages and a certain sort of um, barriers uh, in terms of how they could capitalize on the opportunities that the industrial strategy has set out to do. And so um, I'm not going to go into depth the sort of economic and financial imperatives for employing that sort of diversity inclusion lens. But again, um, the sort of um, studies that's been done in the past, and I'm very open to hearing your sort of um, thoughts on this, but essentially uh, there's increasingly a lot of literature around how, why we need to um, target policies specifically to those who are disadvantaged. And it actually might be the key to unlocking the UK's sort of productivity problem. Um, so one of the 
the key steps, um, so for instance, McKinsey did a report on gender pay gap, um, and uh, they said that you know by um, 2025, if we actually bridge that gender pay gap in work, we could actually add 150 billion pounds to the UK economy, which is not an insignificant sum. Um, and again, like for companies, because um, we're a business department, uh, we also have a very sort of um, strong case to boost uh, sort of uh, representation of um, different sort of disadvantaged groups uh, in the sort of uh, middle management or senior management sort of ranks. And again, um, McKinsey also did another report that showed, you know, um, companies that are in the top sort of quartile for racial and ethnic diversity are 35% more likely to have financial returns um, above their sort of industry medians. So I think there is a economic and financial case for this, but again, very welcome to sort of hear your thoughts on other sort of research that you yourselves might have done and other studies that you're aware of where we could bolster our sort of arguments on this front. Um, and just to go through very quickly, some of the government policies that we have on um, the sort of diversity inclusion front, um, we have a whole slew of reviews um, on sort of a FTSE sort of boards um, and also audits on particular sort of groups um, and their performance in the UK. We also have quite a lot of engagements of industry through different councils and um, charters and ministerial chaired groups um, to ensure that we are joining up our respective sort of resources um, to target get specific sector specific sort of issues um, on the um, inequalities front and Obviously, Hugo mentioned that um, under the People Foundation, we have quite a lot of policies when it comes to workplace environment because we understand that you know once you enter the workplace, um, there are lots of barriers um, to progression uh, for certain groups, and that um, it's not entirely inclusive um, for certain um, individuals suffering from um, disabilities, for instance, or other sort of um, uh, characteristics. So. Um, I'm just going to end with this slide, and that's the sort of government targets that we have. We have a whole slew, but definitely I think there is scope to do more. Um, obviously, that's not official government line, um, but uh, it's uh, definitely something that uh, we're continually sort of exploring in terms of where are the sort of policy areas that the UK needs to go further into um, and come up with policy interventions that really could help unlock that productivity issue that I discussed and Hugo discussed earlier. Um, and I have two slides of questions for you all. I understand that you're not probably going to be able to address all of these, but I think one of the top sort of issues that we're trying to grapple with is what are the top sort of um, the top sort of issues that the government needs to focus on in order to really address that productivity issue. Some people say that you know it's like infrastructure. So for instance, we need to just connect disconnected places, and that will definitely lift sort of like you know the struggling places up to the levels of like London. That's you know. Um, disputable. Um, but uh, other people say that, you know, it's all about skills, all about skills. Um, so really keen to hear your thoughts in terms of like, you know, and very happy to also hear, uh, given that this is an international sort of audience here, um, what are your sort of like countries' experiences when it comes to addressing productivity issues in your country? And what are the sort of like interventions that government can do can, that could really sort of accelerate um, our sort of economic growth without leaving people behind? Um, so that concludes my presentation. Presentation. I think I kind of went over time too, didn't I? Slightly, but... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> a very, very big thank you to both Emma and Esther. And again, really, really fascinating talks on diversity and inclusion within policy making and also within diversity and inclusion within the context of the industrial strategy. So what we do have, as Esther's mentioned, is a few moments where we're actually going to open it up to the audience. And if you have any comments, any questions, we're going to take a few of those responses now, put them to uh, Emma and Esther at the front, and then we're gonna proceed from there. So are there any questions or suggestions specifically in this area of diversity and inclusion in policy making, or diversity and inclusion within the industrial strategy more widely? So, right, I'll give you numbers, we'll go right. Yes. I will, I will give you my microphone, that's how generous I am. Oh, a second one, okay, awesome, great. So, um, hands up nice and high. Oh, awesome, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna go round in a circle like this, we'll start over here, we'll take all of them on. If you wanna write them down so that we can go through in one swoop and then in that way be very effective with time. Yes, brilliant, over here. 
Thank you. Hi, my name's Jennifer Churchill. I'm from Kingston University, so I'm afraid boringly from the UK to start <laughs> with. I just wonder if you've heard of the Women's Budget Group, and in terms of infrastructure, whether you're aware of some of the work coming from there that talks about having a broader understanding of infrastructure so that you would include <coughs> things such as childcare mm -hmm. within infrastructure, because that might be something interesting to look at, because I think childcare is a big part of this question. Mm -hmm. And secondly, a slightly harsher comment, in terms of your targets, I can only assume that they've been worsening significantly for the last 10 years. Is that true? Do you have any trend data on your targets? Thank you. Hi, thanks. Can you hear me? Yeah, thanks a lot for this. My name is Nicolas Ponsvignon. I work in a university in, in Johannesburg. Um, I had two very quick questions, if I may. The first one is about the elephant that's right in front of Professor Ben Fine here. Um, the UK has a massive car industry, quite a large industry. Lots of people are employed there. If the UK crashes out of the EU in a couple of months' time, uh, a lot of companies, Nissan being the one I know best, mm -hmm. are likely to shut down their factories. Do you have a plan? The second question I had was... I'm not sure um, that's domestic related, but okay. <laughs> no, 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 well, that's on, on the first presenter, maybe he has a plan. Um, and, and the second question I had is, is just in relation to the diagnosis you, you offered that it seems that the main thrust for the productivity, for the industrial strategy, um, is to say that there's been a decline in productivity growth in Britain. Am I right? Mm -hmm. And you're emphasizing this. And, and what you've presented <gasps> is the fact that there is huge geographical disparities within the country. Uh, it's not unique. I think it's perhaps more pronounced, indeed, with London's weight, but it's not unique to Britain. And it's a fairly normal thing, right? Some areas cluster a number of, of advantages that, you know, better staff people, better infrastructure. Doesn't mean you can't do anything about it, but it's, it's, a, it's a classical phenomenon. But what I, what I was wondering about is what are your hypotheses about why there's been this decline compared to other countries of productivity? I don't think you said anything about this, and I, I wonder if the answer of how to respond to it may not actually have to flow from an understanding of why there's been this dip. And my, my suspicion, is it might just about have something to do with austerity policies that have been creating the kind of inequalities that you're now trying to respond to with this very beautiful and very inspiring uh, DNI policy. Great question. Um, my name is Luisa, I'm from Brazil, but I would, I'm very interested in this, in this kind of topics and I thought um, your presentation on, on social and diversity inclusion was very inspiring. But I, I do have a question. Um, I mean, I, I agree with you that this is de uh, definitely a condition to have s socially inclusive policies and a, a socially fair growth, or however you want to put it. Um, however, it's not a sufficient condition either. Um, and then, especially in the sense that Nicholas was saying, in the context of austerity policies, um, maybe we have a diverse um, policy making, but not necessarily a diverse and inclusive um, impact on people. And then uh, I would be interested to see how, it, um, how is this monitoring going, or how, also in line with the previous question, how are these indicators showing, and does this actually translate in, in more inclusive results? Mm -hmm. uh, yes, thank you. Um, my name is Christian. I'm also from the current EPO cohort. And my question goes in the same similar direction. So I'm German and we have, um, I guess you know, like a huge uh, minimum or like a uh, low wage sector. Mm -hmm. And um, so, which is, I guess, can also be seen like in, in racial terms or like in, in just, yeah, in the division. And I wonder how the situation is in the UK right now. And as you quoted this McKinsey study and they say, okay, if we, um, if, if you include uh, or like uh, be more inclusive in the in the economy, uh, the economy might gain like 150 billion in, in GDP. Mm -hmm. So I wonder, um, like, how how do they calculate this, or like, how do you think um, this will be reached? Because, I mean, it, it's like a big issue, like which is really connected with austerity, right? Like, um, I mean, there's no reason why you don't uh, why one wouldn't say, okay, we just uh, increase wages in the sense and have the same effects. Um, which McKinsey says, so I really just wonder how do you think and how does McKinsey think um, is this, is the link here? I, I just wonder about it, I'm curious. 
thank you. I'm Luisa. I'm from Austria. Um, and I have a question which is related to actually the first part of what we heard in your presentation, namely that um, where you spoke about the five foundations. Um, you mentioned that um, there should be a focus on improving um, the STEM field and education in um, technology related um, topics. And I'm sure you're perfectly aware that this is very much in contrast with the, the um, diversity and inclusion ideas because obviously it's mostly men that profit um, from any improvements or like um, focus that is laid on STEM fields because women are underrepresented. Um, so I wonder um, how you how you how you tackle this issue, how you realign them, like your um, diversity and inclusiveness uh, goals, and on the other side the education um, focus there. Thank you. I want to make three polemical points. I'm Ben <laughs> Fine from the University of London. The first thing is. Everyone in this room knows that the drop in the productivity figures and uh, the poor performance of the British economy is associated with the role of finance, uh, as indeed is the wealth of the Southeast. But you've had absolutely nothing to say about that at all. What that is, what is the role of finance in generating pro investment, productivity, high wages, skills, and employment? The second point I want to make is about the nuclear, nuclear power program. Again, we can't go into this in detail. But the proposals from government are for an unproven technology that has overrun costs, overrun completion times, and is absolutely and completely male-dominated. And then the third point I want to make, which is a little bit personal, uh, I am the parent of a special needs son who is 21 years old. I've had a lot of experience of dealing with special needs. And I would say current policy is one in which, which is shifting away from meeting legal minimum requirements at minimum costs towards not even meeting legal requirements of provision. So how you're putting forward policies for benefiting those with special needs at the same time as denying them the capacity to develop themselves in any way whatsoever, even to the point of meeting minimum legal requirements, suggests there's some sort of problem with joined up policy. All right, so uh, what if, uh, thank you so much for for your presentation, that was quite fascinating. Um, well, I have a question that might go in the same direction, although way less sophisticated in the way I'm going to ask it. It's just I was just very curious about the way you actively implement uh, diversity and inclusion into policy making, and if you had any, if you had actually the possibility and the, the opportunity to uh, kind of implement it in, uh, with the, the, the companies and the firms you, you work with. And it was actually very interesting, the fact that um, when you talk about diversity and inclusion, you, you, you also uh, mention ideologies, because um, ideology is something that I think all of us have been maybe a bit, uh, let's say, put on the side for. Uh, and I was very interested in the way that, in the th I mean, you, you say that, uh, Ideology leads to um, ill, uh, ill advice, or maybe just ba bad advice and bad uh, policy recommendations. And I was very interested in the, in the idea that how how can you uh, maybe how can you? I, I don't want to sound controversial or anything. I'm just, I'm just very curious about it. I just want to say, like, how 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 do you promote diversity and inclusion by saying that you actually feel like ideologies ideologies are not kind of bad, let's, let's just say bad. So how can ideologies be bad while at the same time you, promote, you want to promote diversity? So that's maybe the, the two questions I want to ask. Okay, so we've got two final questions, one over here and one over here. 
Uh, hi. Um, I just wanted to ask, obviously, um, there are historical reasons for why countries like the UK, the US, European countries are in the advantaged position they are now, but that also places them in a position where they can actually have a substantial impact on the progress of developing countries, especially in the context of climate change and improving people's lives. So I was just interested in whether there was any thought towards any sort of collaborative partnerships with developing countries or even so, say we have a skill gap here, obviously those skills will be useful in other places. So in terms of sharing uh, our skills or our capacities um, for the betterment of both parties involved in whatever project. Okay, and my final one, okay. Uh, my, my part of my research deals with um, uh, the transformation of higher education and especially tuition fees, okay? And I, I was wondering whether uh, diversity and cl inclusion policy is really consistent with tuition fees implementation as it, it has been done in, in the UK. And, and when we see now that the current debt of the student is securitized, is just, I mean, the, the, you, you know exactly the, the, the issue. And that at the very end, the state uh, did not save anything because the cost of guaranteeing the, 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 the debt of the students is almost, I mean, the cost is almost the same that what the government saved when he decided to implement tuition fees. I think that we should, we could promote really uh, diversity and inclusion by withdrawing tuition fees. And it's a real debate in the US. It, it has been a, a very huge debate in the UK. And when we see the transformation of the UK uh, higher education, I really think a major industrial policy in favor of diversity and inclusion would be to maybe come back to a free education. Well, a very big round of applause for all of those who have given questions and comments at this time. We really apologize that obviously in the interest of time, we're not able to get to all of the other questions that were definitely out there, but we appreciate the ones that we've had so far. And in that context, I quickly hand over to Emma and Esther for any quick reflections that they have or responses. Yeah, I think we just need to start this with the caveat that we're civil servants, so we don't have any political opinions on some of the things that you've asked us about. We literally can't answer those questions, I'm afraid, especially being filmed. So um, come talk to me afterwards with a coffee, if you like. Um, but uh, especially as someone who used to work for the UK National Union of Students, I have certain opinions on things. Uh, but we can't answer some of those questions, I'm afraid. And some of those things aren't things that we have influence over. So whilst you make very good points, they're not necessarily for us to be able to answer for you. We will do our best um, as people who work within policy and care about these things deeply. Right. Um, yeah, with that said, um, I'll try to give as much as I am uh, legal allowed uh, to say. Um, so Jennifer's question, um, great. Thank you so much for flagging that. Um, I am aware, but I'm not aware of the uh, sort of work that is done on the infrastructure. So I'll definitely do. Yeah, let's pick up afterwards on that front. Um, in terms of the targets that government has set and in terms of the trends, uh, we do, but we do have to dig it out from other departments. So I'm very happy to connect you with um, the policy leads who have set out those uh, targets and see whether or not we could get some trends going for you. But short answer is no, we do not have a fancy dashboard just yet. Um, but that is something that uh, the um, team has been working on in terms of making sure that we have the sort of success metrics and the indicators um, for the industrial strategy, both internally um, for our sort of internal policy making processes, but also externally facing. We have something called the IS Council, and they're an independent body that is set up, um, chaired by Andy Haldane, and they have. Um, uh, basically been tasked with creating a sort of um, a set of metrics to measure the success independently of government. So we have no sort of like influence in terms of how, uh, what sort of indicators that they use to um, measure the IS's success. So um, that's the space to watch. Um, and the sort of um, reports that uh, they do uh, produce um, on an annual basis to measure whether or not the UK is making any dent on the sort of productivity front. Um, on Nicola's point on automotive, um, I definitely agree with you that um, we are definitely preparing um, for uh, in any sort of um, event um, of no deal. Um, there's definitely been ramped up efforts in government right now um, to ensure that um, UK industries are not um, adversely 
impacted, and if they are, um, that measures are put in place to ensure that um, we could continue to um, uh, sustain um, the, the jobs that are um, in the UK right now, and also the industries that uh, and the companies that have chosen to make um, the UK its home. So, um, but I can't say any more uh, than that um, on that front, unfortunately. But um, what the industrial strategy uh, has um, tried to do is through the sector deals that Hugo has touched on, um, we do try to um, ensure that uh, whatever sort of policies and deals that we do make with um, specific sectors uh, in the UK, um, that we do take into consideration those sorts of um, impacts. And government has invested, I can't remember the exact uh, number, um, but billions uh, through the sector deals process um, to uh, ensure that um, we are still trying to um, uh, ensure that the UK is still at the forefront of these um, industries. Um, so uh, the sort of uh, question on, um, I don't know if you wanted to take any of the other ones. The so there was just a, there was a couple of points about the gender pay gap. So yeah. um, there's a technical point around that, which is that um, gender pay gap and equal pay are two very different things. Um, so gender pay gap actually indicates more more that there are less women in higher paid positions and more women in lower paid positions, even though they may be getting paid equally to the people that uh, to the men that are in those positions as well. So actually, for us, it's not. Um, as simple as that being an austerity issue, although there will be relations to that in terms of like secondary effects to do with things like childcare and that kind of stuff as well. Um, but but that's a, that's a slightly more complex question in terms of equal pay versus gender pay gap. Um, and the question in terms of impact and how do you how do you uh, how do you distinguish between and how do you measure? Um, inclusion within the policy making process itself and then the impact um, we have so the thing I talked about before in terms of public sector equality duty there is a requirement for every every policy that's written by government to go through something called an equality analysis which means that you have to be able to prove that that policy does not discriminate against the protected characteristics under the Equality Act um, I can't say that that's necessarily something that's um, it's not like it's something that people look at every single time something happens in a lot of detail. So some people are taken to court over it and some people are not. And sometimes people get away with those kinds of things and sometimes they don't. And that's that's companies, organisations, all sorts. But the, the principle is there to protect that in terms of outcomes. So that's the idea of the Equality Act. Um, I hope that makes sense. But ask me afterwards if it doesn't. And then there was a woman at the back who talked about STEM education um, and the sort of underrepresentation in STEM right now. That's something that um, DCMS, which is Department for Culture, Media, and Sports, um, are very live to, and they have supported quite a few initiatives um, in the sort of like tech. Uh, sector, such as a tech talent charter, um, to ensure that uh, there's more women represented. Um, and we're continually working with Department for Education to ensure that um, when we do roll up sort of like the education policies in the sort of like tech sectors, in the tech sort of like field, sorry, STEM, um, that uh, we do take into consideration the sort of like um, potential sort of like barriers um, that might uh, be posed to girls who want to take up sort of STEM subjects. And so even within Bayes, we have quite a few programs um, targeted at uh, women and young girls um, when they're trying to choose the sort of um, the courses that they want to take in school versus um, uh, to all the way to sort of like the um, career sort of trajectories that they want to take. We have something called like the STEM ambassador, for instance, um, and also the Crest Awards that we do try to encourage more sort of women and underrepresented sort of uh, um, communities to um, engage in. So. Oh, so two, two questions. Um, so I don't think I should get into a discussion about austerity, um, but I can try and answer your questions on, on the underlying causes of productivity from, from a government perspective. And I think the first thing to say is the industrial strategy, given its structure, as I said at the beginning, it, it's built on the recognition that I don't think we have a singular answer at the moment, and, and it's, pretty, it's a pretty I mean, wide strategy. It captures a huge range of different policies built on the recognition that I don't think we have identified a singular or even two or three causes of that. Um, of that, I think there is there is a point around skills, and I think that is a particular issue facing in the UK. And are we providing um, students or, or children in the UK w with the appropriate level of technical st skills? Uh, and then are we kind of in terms of our economy, do we have kind of high productive sectors? Uh, so that's making sure that in terms of our sector deals, are those sectors forward facing and adapting to the changing global environment? Um, I mean, if you look at kind of our aerospace sector deal. For example, are we, um, and we have a future of flight challenge, which is um, funding investment in, in kind of a, um, electric, basically, is it electric, is drones and, uh, and basically electric planes. 
So are we making sure that those are kind of those sectors are keeping pace with with global developments and that they are kind of yeah um, then also do, do, do people in the UK have, have the kind of those those advanced skills and I think traditionally the UK has kind of flagged behind in terms of stem stem skills and technical education um, and if you if you talk to kind of the the um, kind of the team who, who, who were behind the green paper and the white paper, they would say that if you look at kind of the Germany, for example, that was a big inspiration in terms of our T levels. Um, the finance uh, point I I is a good one. Um, and I think that if you look and if you read it, I don't know if any of you have read the entire industrial strategy, but working with business and leveraging private finance is absolutely um, vital to delivering on, on the targets of the industrial strategy. I mean, we've set ourselves a 2.4% target, so that's that's 2.4% of of GDP is spent inve is invested in R&D, and that's both public and private um, uh, finance. Um, so it, it's it's really really important, and we're trying to leverage that private finance in a number of ways. I mean, DIT are doing a lot in terms of attracting FDI um, into the UK. We have our trade commissioners um, who are they're kind of coordinating activity in, in all the different regions, trying to unlock new re uh, markets. Um, but also, I mean, if you if you look at our just published today our green finance strategy, looking at how we can green finance. But that that's all about working with the private sector to encourage them to invest in in new and, and growing sectors of the economy, um, and using public money to unlock additional um, finance. Um, and if you look, I mean, the other example is our industrial strategy challenge fund, which is which is co-funded challenges to support the missions in in the um to support which which supports grand challenges. Um, around uh, a bit of work, okay, yeah, I mean, yeah. So we are working with other, we are working with, so this is what, oh, this is kind of home territory. Um, so we are working with countries globally on, on the grand challenges, and we have a number of funds which facilitate that. Um, you have the fund for international collaboration, so um, uh, we announced the collaboration with Japan in, in January, working with them on, on, on research related to kind of aging society and AI and data. So, for example, looking at um, early diagnosis um, of, of diseases. Um, but also, we have our kind of a significant amount of money dedicated to working with developing countries on these issues. So, our Global Challenges Research Fund and our Newton Fund. Um, so, um, another recent example: the President of Colombia uh, visited um, the UK last week or the week before, but now we're, we're working with them in terms of um, kind of clean growth and, and partnering on, on climate change to help them transition to kind of a, a clean, a low carbon economy. Um, so going forward, partnering with both developing and more developed countries is absolutely uh, vital in, in delivering on the aims and industrial strategy because, I mean, we can, we can work on clean growth, we can set a net zero target, but that's absolutely useless unless other countries around the world are also kind of delivering on those aims. And um, there are other issues like our um, other initiatives, which I've completely forgotten in the spare of the moment, um, where we're trying to kind of display that, display that leadership. But there is a lot more to do. Brilliant. Excellent. So a really, really big thank you to all of your, for, well, for all of your questions and to our panelists for their responses. I think it's safe to say I'm never, ever going to be hired as a timekeeper again. But outside of that, if it's in service of your incredible questions, it's definitely, definitely a good thing. So on that basis, I'm more than happy to call upon our next speaker, who is Mateus Mondonka uh, Oliveira, who is going to be speaking to you about insights f uh, into the industrial strategy, specifically with the lens of economics. Mateus. Thank you, Horatio. Can you see me? Yeah, great. Excellent. Um, so I know we are basically out of time, so I'm going to be as fast as I can, uh, just briefly going uh, through with um, an overview, very, very fast overview of what has been done in the economics domain behind the strategy, the research has been done. Um, this is very, very much non-exhaustive. Uh, and also, I'm going to, from time to time, point out where I think heterodox economics has a lot to contribute to and, uh, and, and, um, and uh, give more, even more uh, insights on where we can improve and where we can uh, find better, better connections with um, the productivity problem. So just a little bit of a background how policy making uh, 
occurs in government. Uh, so there is um, the Green Book, which is, which was published is published by Treasury, and is basically a manual of how you start your policy, then develop the policy, monitor the policy, feedbacks, and and the process um, repeats itself. So that's why we have the roadmap cycle, which is in the Green Book. So the rationale for policy objectives, appraisal, monitoring, evaluation, feedback. And then I think the yellow ones, the ones you can see highlighted in yellow, are the ones I think um, uh, he took, uh, uh, he heterodox analysis can make its way uh, into policy making uh, because the rationale for intervention is how, once you have a, a policy idea, you have to think about why, why am I intervening? Wh why the government has to do something about this particular issue? So uh, currently, and I'm gonna go through this a little bit later, um, the, in the manual, uh, the main rationale is the market failure one so if you find a market failure, then the government should intervene. But of course, as you know, there are many other assumptions we can use for how we uh, implement policy. Then the appraisal part is what, what do you use to assess it? What model are you using? So you're using the SG model to appraise your policy. Are you using a case study? But then, of course, you may use a SFC model, a sectoral, a sectoral analysis model, um, to think about uh, the policy. Uh, just going a uh, back to the uh, productivity puzzle, uh, things we know uh, are is that there are low levels of investment um, that are causing uh, this problem, uh, this uh, stagnation in productivity. We know there's poor managerial cap capabilities. We know the problem of geographic disparity in productivity and also disparity among sectors. You see, if you look at the graph, you can see that dif there are different levels of productivity per sector. There's also a question of how we actually measure productivity. Do we actually should use output per wor hour worked, et cetera? There's also uh, debates happening in that front. But again, things that the, the heterodox approach can ha actually help understand that is, uh, what are the demand side explanations for that productivity problem? What are, is it the, the, causa the does the causality run from productivity to GDP or is it GDP that drives productivity? How do we understand that? Uh, also, a lot has, has to be said about uh, the spare capacity in those sectors. Well, how the spare, cap spare capacity is distributed across, and what is what what can we talk about when when we uh, when we mention aggregate demand in these different um, sectors, and what what is the role of the global financial crisis in that diminishing aggregate demand and therefore diminishing your capacitization in your unit cost uh, goes up. Then, if I if I want to talk about foundations and if I want to go and have a look at infrastructure. What we know, we know that uh, infrastructure investment is an important thing, but we are unclear of what kind of investment should we be doing? What kind of, uh, what kind of infrastructure investment should we be prioritizing? And as you see, there, there is, there is um, already um, a huge uh, challenge for the UK there because uh, gross uh, capital formation has been on the, lower fr on the lower side of the graph, is the orange one compared to all the economies. So how do we go about creating uh, how do we go about increasing uh, gross capital formation in the country? And so I think there, there's a lot to be said from a heterodox perspective, how these two relate, how domestic gross capital formation relates to FDI, for instance, uh, and which one causes uh, which. Again, if we look at the People's Foundation, and we think, if you look at the graph, um, the, the heat map actually, you, you see that uh, most of the UK is, um, uh, is at high risk of, uh, of uh, being um, unemployed, because of automation, so 30 to 35 percent of the of the employed workforce in these in in these re in the red regions regions are uh, at risk of being simply uh, displaced by machines. So how we go about absorbing that labor force? So there is a lot to be said on how uh, the labor market works and how do we actually create labor demand for these things. So if from a heterodox perspective you don't see the trade-off between wages and employment, so then how do we go about uh, creating employment, creating growth? Perhaps looking at in, in using uh, clean technology that it has lower productivity and therefore you increase uh, your capacity to absorb labor and things like that which fits with industrial strategy because the clean growth is one of the great challenges. So also the skills problem, we, we are aware that there is also not only a problem in the supply side of skills, there's also a problem in the demand side. There are much, many uh, skills in the workforce but also in the in, the, in society in, in general that are not being used. How we make sure we are using those and they're not being uh, underutilized. Um, again, uh, so some economists uh, may like to put the industrial strategy in a production function. When I looked at this at first, I thought, well, this is a product production function, which is very elegant because you can uh, name all these things and you can save infrastructure, machinery, productivity, so on and so forth. And if you add everything up and if one goes up, the other ones remain the same, there you go, have productivity increase. Well, this is very good. And then you can put everything under the pillars of productivity, so on and so forth. Uh, and that's one way to look at things. But then 
one of the things then I think heterodox economics can make its way through is thinking about what are the demand variables that are uh, making those uh, supply variables uh, grow. What, what is the, how, how, what, which demand variable is actually important for uh, when we think about uh, creating public capital or uh, increasing uh, human capital or increasing um, private uh, investment, private uh, capital formation. And then also looking at the product, uh, how the, the causality is running from one side of the equation from to the other. So is it, again, is GDP growth, that uh, GDP per capita growth that then pushes all those variables or are those variables that uh, push the other one? Or how is it the, ac the acceleration process that occurs through time with those variables? So then I'm uh, just gonna give you a quick run through one of the examples that actually uh, heterodox school of thought made its way into the industrial strategy. So when we, look, we looked at the grand challenges, we, we were faced with some analytical problems. So how do you insert fundamental certainty in, in that framework? Because by essence, the industrial strategy does deal with a lot of uh, fundamental certainty because you, you're looking at processes that will take decades uh, to, to, to reveal their problems and the economy will completely change its structure. So uh, economic theories that are capable of really integrating very well the concept of uncertainty will, will be very successful in, uh, in, in making its way through policy making at this stage and especially with this kind of policy because uh, if, if you use an economic theory that makes the mistake of, um, of uh, thinking about uncertainty as a somewhat of a, of a risk, something that you can make, make a risk assessment, you can put a prob probability on, then, uh, then of course it, it's not gonna fit with, with, with the industrial strategy. Uh, so, and, and then again, there are other problems as well, problems of inter in, in the interdependencies, high path uh, dependency in when you're running your models and thinking about the industrial strategy. So uh, if, if you're using an economic theory that assume some sort of a, a equilibrium growth rate that the economy is always trying to go back to, then you're not uh, actually, you're not gonna ever be able to tackle to the, to the new, new type of economy you're gonna have in the future. The, the, and you're gonna be able to achieve the targets and the missions that we put ourselves to. Um, then, if, then there is already a recognition that the main method to understand policy making is uh, or not enough to, under, to, to make sure we have a successful industrial strategy because normally you use the market failure approach to, uh, to, to decide on public uh, funding of R&D, for instance. Um, then then uh, economists in government developed the idea of systems of innovation, uh, which already, uh, comes out of the observation that countries have different ways, different, different economic performance, and also different ways that they diffuse innovation. So understanding how the network of different things actually make an innovation get out of the research, this research stage to the commercialization stage. And this feeds a lot, this in systems of innovation approach feeds a lot from evolutionary economics. Uh, and it sees, it sees the, uh, the problem of uh, inserting a new innovation as a problem of a system, not a problem of, uh, of, a, of, a, of market failure, but a problem of system failure. So it talks a lot about capability failure, failure institutions, network failures, framework failures. It does still use uh, the, the word failures, but it, it goes beyond and it sees the state uh, and the market as a, an organism rather than something that they say just have to fix here and there. Um, and, but again, it does not really, really gives a role for the state itself, that the, this uh, system of innovation. It does not as well like talk about the direction. What is the direction you actually want to take your economy? So then that's why the government commission work from, um, from uh, UCL, um, there is a work, um, a task force that is led by Mariana Mazzucato, whom many of you know, uh, and then they came out with a report uh, that said that the industrial strategy should be uh, uh, used in a mission-oriented uh, approach, so using missions, using targets, long-term targets, and seeing the state as a market shaper instead of market fixer, and using this uh, assumption that there is an, orga an organism and that the state and is part of that organism in directing the, the the, the economy uh, with, uh, with, um, with the mind of having uh, uh, a, different, a different future for, for the economy. So this just uh, goes a little bit on the examples and a bit of details, uh, but just, just to mention that the, the industrial strategy as a, as a mission-oriented policy is simply trying to, uh, to correct a direction of failure rather than a market failure. Uh, and then there you go, then this, 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 then the government took that in and created the missions. So then the missions are quantifiable, uh, they are measurable, uh, and they have a time, they have a deadline. 
uh, and this this drives the the, the policy forward. And it it also already already by itself pushes the government to use uh, the idea that public investments can actually leverage uh, private investment. That actually, the the crowd out effect does not does not occur, and that in this case, the crowd in do, does occur. So you invest, you make public investment grow, and then private, private the private sector will uh, pick up. And the idea, and uh, also not only. In, in the abstract, the idea is you also choose the, the sectors you want to to do that, um, and and indeed in in the last uh, in the last uh, two years, the actually the gross capital formation, but from the side of the public sector, has been growing much faster than it ever was in the last uh, decades. So that's just very very brief overview of what we have been doing, uh, how heterodox economics makes its way into into the industrial strategy. But there are many things we, we can explore in in that front. So. I just, uh, again, thank you for the opportunity to listen to us. So a very, very big thank you to Matthias. Now, I know that from looking around the room, there are lots of hot people. But I've seen the fans going into overdrive. But not to fear, we have some very cool speakers coming to you. See what we've done there. Oh. So very interestingly, in our next segment, I'm going to be welcoming two speakers who are going to be providing two perspectives on heterodox um, economics. So I'm going to invite them up to the front, and in turn, each of them is going to speak. But the first is J. Christopher Proctor from Oikos, and the second is going to be and the second is going to be uh, Ron Slava Grodko from the University of Wits Wits What's uh, Rand. <laughs> Wits. Yeah. Wits. 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 Brilliant. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I am Jay Christopher, and I'm from the 2016 cohort, option B. And I had a feeling that the EPOG crowd might have a few questions, so I've prepared a light speed presentation so we don't stay too long. So I was asked to summarize what heterodox economics has to say about policy in about 10 minutes. So let's see how this goes. Um, so the first thing to say is that it's been a pretty rough decade for orthodox economics. Uh, the decade that started with the giant financial crisis has really not gone a whole lot better since then. And particularly in the last few years, as the, the realities of climate change have become so unavoidable, it's become clear that, that more is needed than, than the orthodox toolbook. And a lot of these unorthodox ideas have really been gaining traction, particularly outside of academia. Um, so with students, but also with the public and, and some policymakers, which is quite interesting. Um, and the use of the words heterodox economics have skyrocketed in, in publications. So what I'm going to do is try to run through nine really big D ideas about the economy from heterodox economics. And I'm specific here by saying ideas about the economy and not methodologies of doing economics. Because I think we sometimes get lost quite a bit on the, the post-Keynesians versus the Marxists, but, but just looking at what do we have to say about the real economy. Um, so the first, and I'm so glad that this came up so many times in the first presentation, uh, is that the economy is almost always operating under capacity. And, and I'm gonna come back to this one because it's really central, and it was interesting how often it kept coming back up. Um, the second is that systems of innovation drive long-term growth. Uh, this is something that we've heard quite a bit and, and is really catching on in a lot of the literature and policy. The third is that banks can create virtually unlimited amounts of money and that that's a problem. And this is where we get a lot of ideas about credit cycles and bubbles and how the financial sector can feed on itself and really drive us into bad places. Uh, but the fourth is that government can also create virtually unlimited amounts of money and that that could actually be a solution. And, and so this is where we start to think about the breakdown in the traditional relationship between printing money and inflation and, and what that might mean for policy going forward. Uh, the fifth is that ownership and power shape the economy. Um, this is one that seems quite fundamental but is really not something that economists like to talk about. We're quite uncomfortable with ownership and power. And this really drives a lot of the rationale for government ownership of large parts of the economy. Uh, the sixth is that working with people is different than working with machines. And this is, this is an interesting one because 
it brings in a lot of gendered aspects into the economy because most economies, women more likely work with people and men more likely work with machines. But it also breaks down on sectoral lines, which I think Francesca will bring up more and, and really explain some of the divergences and how the different sectors of the economy have been doing. Um, the seventh, Economies function better when more people are involved in decision making. And, and this was really great to see this connected in with some of the diversity points. And it's something that you, you see a lot in cooperative economics, participatory economics, but, but also even just in corporate board structures and sort of very, I wouldn't necessarily say mainstream business practices, I guess. Um, but there's also sort of another side, which is the more Hayekian view of knowledge and, and that knowledge comes from the people and builds itself up into the economy. And if you take that seriously, there's a lot of implications for how businesses should be run. Um, the eighth, there is no such thing as a free market. This is sort of a, a gigantic thing in, to which a lot of different things can fit. But the idea is really that market economies are embedded into different institutions within society, but also that people act in kind of crazy ways and that sometimes we want something because other people want it or we want something because it costs more money regardless of what the actual uh, quality of the good is. And finally, number nine and last is that Economies must balance their ecological and their social constraints. And this is another one that's really caught on in the last 10 years, is that it isn't just about maximizing growth, it's about balancing how the economy is for people and for what it does to the environment. So, if we can remember all the way back to point number one, I wanna talk a little more about capacity because it really is something that underlies a lot of what we're talking about and a lot of times we can talk past each other if we're not clear on what we think about capacity. So the idea is that if there is more capacity in the economy that it is not currently using, then that would determine whether or not all of these good things that we want to do, like decreasing inequality or building windmills, this determines whether or not that increases growth or whether or not that displaces other economic activity. And, and so if you think, tried to do the graphs here, but if you have the actual output and a potential output that's much higher, by stimulating demand, by doing basically anything, but really all the good social things we want to do, you can create growth and possibly create enough growth to finance the activities that you're trying to, to actually do. Um, and so that's why it's so important, is it's a way to get out of a lot of the trade-offs that are inherent in economic policy, although not some of the ecological trade-offs, which is where I think heterodox economics has a lot more thinking to do. Um, but, but the reason that this is such a sticky concept is the way it's dealt with in classical and later neoclassical economics. So traditionally within economics, there's an assumption that anytime something is created, the supply side, the demand to purchase that thing is automatically created. So when you take that super seriously, it means there can never be a demand shortage in the economy. And for a long time, that was sort of the orthodox wisdom. Um, that really fell apart during the Great Depression. It became quite hard to argue, although some people still did, that that was, that was what was going on. But now most people do admit that in short-term crises, there is a problem of demand and having enough demand for the economy. But in the long term, everything is as it should be. We are in the best of all possible worlds because the actual output and the potential output are effectively the same. Um, and so just to show some numbers or some graphs on this, in green we have the, the traditional output, potential output measurements. Um, and this is all for the United States. And, and you can see that they, they bounce right around zero. Sometimes they're a little under, particularly during crises, but in general, there is not so much excess capacity that the economy could be using. Um, and, but something that's quite interesting, th this comes from a paper done by some researchers at Roma Tre, which is one of our partner universities for EPOG. And in the red, they, they tried to estimate based on real economy factors, particularly unemployment, and said, what would the actual output be if we think about unemployment? And, and the numbers are huge. I mean, we're averaging closer to five to 10% in any given year for how much potential output could be lost just because of insufficient demand. And so what does that actually look like when you try to add it up over a couple decades? And so here, the very bottom line is actual GDP, and the line right under it is the potential growth in each year, so how much they could have grown that year. And the red line is the cumulative effect for if we had matched our peak growth each year, what would the economy have looked like? And the gap is enormous. 
it's about a 40% difference, about $10 trillion for the United States case alone. Um, and, and there's a pretty huge caveat that of the industrialized economies, the US has done okay over the last 50 years. I would be very interested to see this for Italy, for Spain, even for France, and, and how, much, how much capacity is being left on the table. And, and so, just to say that luckily, we, we have a second shot. We are still able to try to fix this. Um, and, and I think that it's really good to try to think of what is it that we could do with the economy? What is the productive capacity? If we really mobilized the economic resources we had, what could we achieve? Um, and, and that that could be quite an inspiring goal. And thank you. All right, thank you, Jay Christopher. And now we are going to approach a little bit closer to this, to this uh, issue of heterodox economics and uh, productivity. And the first notion I will uh, mention is Bressa Pereira's uh, five key prices, which is uh, actually originally developed uh, for uh, developing countries, the concept developed for developing countries, which basically states that there are five key prices that are um, the underlying prices for both domestic and foreign agents to make all the decisions, which is the inflation rate, the profit rate, uh, the wage rate, the interest rate, and most importantly, the exchange rate. And the level of the exchange rate uh, should be, uh, the exchange rate actually has uh, two uh, purposes. First one is to rebalance uh, the current account. And the second one is to be uh, rather low enough, namely the exchange rate should be um, uh, weak enough, we would say, depreciated enough to allow uh, productive uh, sophistication and industrialization, which is essentially to allow uh, productivity gains. And the importance of exchange ra rate is actually extremely important if we want to address the original question that I was asked by uh, Matthias, uh, Mateus, sorry, uh, <laughs> uh, which is uh, why did uh, the UK uh, had not, uh, why the UK had not uh, productivity gains while Germany, for example, did? And one of the answers would be that German industry actually enjoys undervalued exchange rates and also excess to the huge uh, European market to sell its products. So uh, basically two components. One is the undervalued exchange rates, and the second one is the high demands that uh, the UK, uh, econ the, the German economy has, while, while the UK economy might lose due to its, uh, its leaving the EU. And the demands, uh, the notion of demands is manifested in the third world's law that basically says that the um, rate of growth is equal to the demand uh, for local products, which is the growth rate of exports, uh, divided by the elasticity of demands for imports, which basically says that if the economy has very high demands for its products, like Germany, then it will probably grow much faster. And um, for example, the East Asian countries like South Korea, China, and uh, um, before this, Japan are very good examples of export-led growth, namely countries that uh, have grown because of exports. And it also goes to the question of increasing uh, returns to scale. Uh, once the, uh, the country is open to big markets and there is a high demand for, for its products, the post Keynesian economic economics actually say that the marginal costs of, uh, of production are not increasing, like in the mainstream theory, but remain the same. And if we have big plants, and namely we have uh, uh, production of scale, uh, those prices are remain constant, and if they are low enough, the economy can be uh, more competitive in foreign markets. And um, now we're actually going to uh, presenting the uh, Maria Mazzucato that was uh, mentioned before. Uh, her argument is quite complex, but she actually actually says that the state, uh, the role of the state in innovation is to steer the direction of, uh, of innovation, which actually uh, prioritizing some research over other research and allocating uh, taxpayers' money between those researchers uh, by creating infrastructure for innovation, namely creating uh, universities, research uh, facilities and agencies, uh, and of course uh, financing them with taxpayers' money. Uh, therefore, there is a huge uh, role for demand uh, for this innovation and the huge importance of uh, fiscal and um, the importance of government consumption of those uh, technologies. And then uh, one of the most important uh, additional uh, role of government is to diffuse, namely just to give those technologies to the private sector and to allow the private sector uh, to create products. 
And it has to lead to this symbiotic relationship between public and private sector uh, that was also mentioned before. And it actually starts at this, uh, at this side, okay, the, the leftmost um, uh, cubic. Uh, when the governments are investing into long-term long uh, research and create this infrastructure. And on this infrastructure, new technologies are created, which later on diffused into the private sector, which is allows uh, the private sector to create uh, new products that it can sell and maximize profits. And then taxes are collected from uh, this economic activity that, that is generated in the private sector and those taxes are used to uh, fund future uh, research and the cycle, the cycle should go on, go, on, go on and on, but the cycle can, the cycle can be uh, disrupted if uh, firms, especially big firms like uh, Facebook, Amazon, and Microsoft are going to places where they are paying less taxes or no taxes at all because uh, there's actually no money to fund future research. And another uh, important case study that uh, Mariana Mazzucato is uh, presenting is the case study case of the iPhone. And the argument is basically all the technologies that make the iPhone so great or any other smartphone so, so great, like the GPS, the internet, the multi-touch uh, screen, and Siri were all developed within uh, state-owned agencies funded by taxpayers' money. And the role of Apple was not creating fundamentally new technologies but creating products out of technologies that were already created. And so we can sum up uh, her argument that private firms are commercializing rather than uh, creating fundamentally new products and knowledge. And that's it. Okay. A really, really big thank you to both of those speakers. And at this time, I call upon two more speakers to join them who are going to be giving uh, further remarks. So I call upon, firstly, Francesca Williams, who will be speaking on feminist economics assessment of the industrial strategies. And also, I call upon uh, Sophie Dorothy Rotemund, who will be speaking about industrial strategy as a societal policy. Please feel, make them welcome. Um, as we said, I'm going to do a brief um, explanation as to what the kind of uh, feminist ideas are of an industrial strategy and what uh, critiques that they have of kind of a, a non-gender um, aware industrial strategy. So first of all, um, starting with um, how feminist economics fits under this umbrella as a school of thought um, of heterodox economics. Um, I'd like to refer back to the really cool nine points that Joe Christopher was making about heterodox economics. So the fifth one he made was about um, ownership and power shape the economy. And of course, for feminist economists, the, one of the most important power relations is that between men and women and how we live in patriarchal societies and how men dominate decision making and power. Uh, the sixth one that uh, Joe Christopher mentioned was uh, working with people is different than working with machines. And he also mentioned how that um, women predominantly work in these uh, uh, industries um, that use people, more to working with people such as uh, social care and teaching, whereas men tend to dominate in industries um, such as construction. And so um, when it comes to making choices about investment and productivity gains, it's often more appealing um, when making, uh, assessing policy to decide to go for the industries that have the most per spending, the highest gains in productivity, and that tends to leave out these uh, sectors which tend to be um, employing women more. And then finally, um, JC mentioned um, finally the economies must um, balance ecological, ecological and social constraints. And feminist eco economists really emphasize uh, the social constraint. Basically, um, there are limits to how much uh, we as individuals can care and support for others, whether it be in our household, our families, within the community, um, before it starts to affect our own productivity and well-being. Um, so we cannot just simply rely on the informal, unpaid uh, sector for caring. 
and we need the formal sector or public sector and government intervention uh, because these non-market, um, these care activities, these non-market activities are crucial uh, to the economy and help to uh, reproduce the workforce. So um, why should we use uh, gender analysis in um, uh, decision making? So as was mentioned earlier, um, really great presentation about bringing women and minorities into key decision roles and from a more theoretical point of view for feminist economists, uh, this is really important because knowledge is situated and so um, researchers or policymakers are always um, embedded in certain historical, social, cultural, economic contexts and so it's great to have policymakers that reflect and understand the different realities we have in society. But feminist economists would also argue that the economic toolkit needs to be broader too in order to make better decisions and to meet policy objectives. And so uh, using a gender lens brings um, light to um, existing inequalities and, and can mean that government intervention um, can be prevented from um, increasing um, inequalities and also getting rid of gender and racial barriers. Um, so going back to um, what was initially talked about, the kind of the grand challenges um, of the UK's industrial strategy, um, two key ones I want to mention are the aging society and um, increasing earnings and labor market participation. Um, and in terms of um, these uh, policy objectives very much can link to the ideas and proposals of um, feminist economics. So um, the main uh, proposal they make is um, greater investment in social infrastructure. And what is this? Um, this is defined as educational uh, health and care services. And the main critique feminist economists make is that the system of national accounts fails to recognize the long-term um, productive contribution of social infrastructure um, that employment in teaching and caring industries, for example, builds and maintains and creates um, the stock of human capital. Um, so compared to just investing in physical infrastructure, uh, there are similar but more gender equal gains uh, to be made in investing in uh, social infrastructure, specifically care industries, so elderly and childcare. Um, and investing in care industries not only helps to tackle low productivity, but also the demographic changes like aging society that most developed countries face, and also uh, gender inequality in paid and unpaid work. So there have been um, some studies to try and uh, quantify um, what would be the impact of a more uh, gender aware um, industrial strategy, for example. So um, we can see here from um, this table that if there was uh, uh, 2% um, of GDP invested in uh, the care, care sector instead of the construction sector, there would be almost twice as much increase in employment and jobs. Um, and this is basically because um, the impact of the multiplier effect on employment, so the direct plus the indirect employment effects are higher when investing in the care sector. Uh, and this is basically because by moving um, some of the burden of care work from the unpaid to the paid sector, it would enable those currently doing unpaid care work to take jobs and increase their level of employment. And currently in the UK, there's around um, 4 million people of working age that are doing some sort of care work. So um, it would, and also the Predominantly, this is done by women, uh, so it would help to tackle uh, gender income inequality, but also it has um, longer term impacts on productivity because um, the movement of the burden of care, um, care work from the unpaid to the paid sector uh, through the greater provision of uh, child care or elderly care would reduce the stress and burden uh, that unpaid carers face, as I mentioned, predominantly women, and help to increase their well being and productivity. Um, in their formal sector work. And also, um, as you can see here, um, even for men, um, the, there is, there's basically no difference in whether um, the investment is in construction or care sector. They, they would still benefit from uh, an increase in employment, but for women, there is a much, much um, 
greater increase in employment, and so it would help to close um, the gender gap in employment. And then finally, as was uh, mentioned in one of the questions um, before, um, an issue that the industrial strategy in the UK is trying to solve is the lack of um, STEM skills, so um, science, technology, engineering, and maths. And I think they said there was like over 400 million pledged in this, and was mentioned there is um, a low proportion of women studying these subjects, so the industrial strategy should try and come up with ways to encourage more women to take up these STEM subjects, which would not only help to reduce the gender wage gap, because it's uh, these jobs uh, with these kind of technical skills tend to be paid higher, but it would also pr boost productivity in the longer run because um, the school shortages the UK faces would be more easily filled. Thank you. Okay, so in order to conclude now, I will explore the wider scope of industrial policies or this industrial strategy and can try to connect it to the earlier talks that we have heard today. However, I'll try to give you a bit in another take on industrial policies and I'll precisely focus on the people aspect or pillar, um, how you want to call it, and explore the hypothesis that by acknowledging people as an active sta stakeholder, an industrial policy actually has the potential to transform an economy and a society. In order to do so, let us first briefly reassess what we've been heard, what we heard so far. So put in a nutshell, the industrial strategy that was presented was mainly about investment, innovation, productivity and growth, whereby entrepreneurs and the state are the main drivers, which are believed to be able to tackle the grand challenges that you have outlined and to generate growth and to provide the setting for according growth. People and their skills are acknowledged to be a fundamental foundation and you also include main um, social challenges such as an aging economy um, or the aspect of work and mental health or diversity uh, like inclusion of um, diverse ethnicities for example. <coughs> However, in a certain sense the industrial strategies presented always resorts to skills and productivity in the end. So what Esther said was earlier, it's really about the human capital and therefore it is about people's contribution to an economy and not necessarily vice versa. So it's a very traditional take, if you want to put it like that, on an industrial policy, a very supply side led um, idea. But when you assess your five grand challenges in more detail, you actually notice that it's not really confined to the economy. And this is also what Matthias had said earlier. It has greater societal implications to it. So immediately we get to the question, well, what about the society? So what about the people in the society? What is their role in an industrial strategy? And what is the role of societal objectives in an industrial policy? So for example, justice, equality, and sustainability, and you've briefly talked about that. <coughs> so this also points toward the fact that in a certain sense, shouldn't an economy work for the people and not the other way around? And how do we manage to get that? Um, so in a certain sense, this requires that we do also see people as an active stakeholder in an industrial policy and include them in key decision-making processes and also in the execution of those processes. Sorry. And um, so if we really think about this, so how do we apply this then in reality? Well, it means inclusion and participation, what you're already trying to do. But I would like to, when you really look at it in the context of the people pillar, it really means, well, potential employees, but also current employees. When we look at potential employees, it's really this inclusion and what you've been previously talked about. But it shouldn't be inclusion just for the sake of an inclusion or for the sake of productivity. It should also be about creating equal opportunities. So which makes the case for redistributive policies, so also tying into the questions of austerity, what should be the role of the state in terms of public spending, and um, of Professor Fleshy, what he earlier said about um, tuition fees, for example. So can we, in a certain sense, with an industrial policy, try to take class barriers? And additionally, you're very looking at the individual in the industrial policy, but we all know that an indiv individual is just as strong as the community around it. So should we really just look at the human capital of an individual, or how do we manage to include communities and really make communities prosperous again? Which then also goes along with how do we get deindustrialized regions thriving again? Well, and if we look at current employees, this obviously embraces workers' participation. 
and their inclusion in the active decision making making processes. And this obviously in a traditional sense implies that working conditions are improved, but it also holds the potential for shaping future growth paths or productivity trends because workers have ideas on how to organize processes. They maybe have ideas on a project or a new products. So we can accord an economy to workers' needs and at the same time boost productivity. And this is what um, I think Emma has said earlier, that when you're living in an environment that is thriving and you're appreciated as an individual, you're more productive, you're less sick. So it's a, in a certain sense, it's a bi-directional way. And I think that is a very important aspect. So in the end, if we put both of these groups together, we would have the opportunity to dampen adverse effects of economic, environmental, and social changes by matching actually the policies with the active participation of workers to their needs. And this obviously also coincides then with another definition of the state. So the state now is not any mere, anymore the mere framework setter, but it's an active mediator Act, uh, and, and really engaging into differences, as Emma put it earlier, and really embracing those differences because we all know about the struggles of, well, that we have between entrepreneurs and workers, but we should try to embrace these struggles and really get something out of this instead of trying to avoid that. And then obviously comes the question, well, why should we do this? And there are three overall potentials that I per personally see. So the first one is to stimulate demand and thereby boost uh, the growth of the economy. It is to accord the future economy to the society's need and not vice versa. And, to, it, and it is to create participation in multilateral dialogue, which implies inclusion. <clears throat> so employee inclusion, as we already said, can then um, help with economic, social, and ecological transformations by according them to workers' needs, which ties into the concept of a just transition, which you probably have heard of. Um, but I personally feel that there's a way greater potential to it too. If we include employees, it gives the potential for local and individualized industrial policies. And this is what, I'm sorry, I don't, yeah, Hugo talked about. So how do we manage to discover local strengths again? And I really think by including workers on a local level and uh, particularly also in small and medium enterprises, you can really get a boost to these. So you create local industry and local value creation. So in a certain sense, reindustrialize, have the potential for reindustrialization of certain regions. You create local demand as an accelerator of local growth. And you create local identification, which I personally think is the, the most important thing. By local identification, people identify with their work, they identify with their employer, with their community, and with their region, which in the long run potentially has then the scope for uh, the potential for these people to turn away from populist ideas or populist narratives and really give them again something in a complex word they can hold on to and really think about and really thrive for and then boost productivity on the aggregate level. So I personally think that there's a lot of challenges by reorientating the industrial policy towards workers. Thank you. So at this stage, a very, very big thank you to both of those speakers, Francesca and Sophie Dorothy. And at this time, I am happy to welcome to the stage for one final Q&A spearheaded by some initial remarks from the amazing Professor Fletcher. <laughs> so uh, we will be, I, I will be quick because we also have, uh, I mean, we are, we are out of time. So uh, <laughs> no, for the first point, first I really want to thank again the volunteers from the, the Students and Alumni Association. So. Thanks again, really, because it was... <laughs> you did a really great job. Then, uh, talking about industrial policy, I mean, wh what I learned about industrial policy in the 60s and 70s was, okay, it was gr what we call the Grand Projet, the great project dedicated to one specific industry, uh, with uh, financed by public banks, uh, done by private companies, with private, uh, done with by pub, financed by public bank, public companies, public research institute. So, of course, we do not have any more uh, big public industry, no many public banks, etc. So the, the situation has, has changed much. And what we call usually now industrial policy, it's not anymore the vertical industrial policy, but a kind of horizontal industrial policy, like creating a framework uh, of uh, competition, sometimes a little 
cooperation. But if you look at what happened uh, in, in the different countries, and I, I've been working uh, on about South Korea, uh, on, on the case of South Korea, it's really, really different. I worked on the, on the, the industry of, the, tele of tele the telecommunication industry, and what they've done is a kind of vertical industrial policy trying to say it's a horizontal, usual competition-based policy. And it's really interesting, uh, in my view, to study such kind of, uh, of country uh, which really implemented something different. I mean, in, 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 the, in South Korea, uh, the state, uh, the companies are private, okay? The big chables, okay? You have uh, LG and you, you know most, most of them. But the state is organizing kind of meeting where they all meet with the state and they discuss what are the priorities, how the state can help, and how they can do it together. And when they need to develop and implement, for instance, the uh, fiber, uh, fiber to the home uh, for telecommunication, in France, in Europe, what, what are we doing? We say, okay, we will put much competition open to competition, deregulate, and it will make, okay, the fiber appears everywhere. And it doesn't work, it doesn't work at all. What they did in Korea, they say, okay, what are our strategic goals? It's to implement fiber? Okay, no problem. So we discuss together, we try to identify how we can do this, eventually cooperating, and we will say to the operator, okay, the previous technology, we will put tax on that technology, so if you want to still have benefits, you have to go to the other technology and develop the, 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 the infrastructure. So it's, it's really, really different. It's very state-driven. While in Europe, it's it's not at all uh, straight state driven. So this is my first remark about maybe, and, and it's not so far from part of what Matsukato says, but maybe I mean in South Korea, it's a kind of a step further with m much more directed by the state. And I think it's inspiring at least to understand how they deal with with those issues. And the second element is about the the issue of coherence of, of, of such a policy. You have four targets, okay, which is uh, mobility, uh, uh, clean uh, growth, and uh, but I'm not sure it's so consistent in a way. Uh, because, uh, I mean, if you look at, uh, if you talk about clean growth, is it really possible when, I mean, I do, don't see many studies explaining that we can decouple growth with gas emission. Um, I'm in an engineering school now teaching, and we are one of the best uh, engineering school working on the uh, um, autonomous ve vehicle. Okay, so it's exactly what you are thinking about. It's great. So, and so we are doing research. We are best artificial intelligence, etc. And I just sent to my lab <laughs> an article taken from the traditional newspaper Le Monde, coming from a, a research center in Bordeaux, saying, "Okay, uh, it's 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 just a nonsense." To, to, to think, uh, to even think that the um, uh, autonomous vehicle will exist one day. And if you speak with Benjamin Coria, one of the professors of the, he says, okay, I know the industry since years, and it's sure there will not be the, autom the, the autonomous. Maybe on some, some roads, maybe you will be able to implement and put, but if you develop this type of vehicle, I mean, you, ha will, you will raise a major problem in terms of uh, ecology and major problems in terms of transportation too, because many people will say, okay, it's great, it's very efficient, eh? but everybody will want this type of vehicle and it, it won't work. So it, it, it's a major issue to understand whether these objectives are really coherent. Uh, and, and, and we prefer not to see if they are or not. But so I raised this, this debate in my own university, which is really at the forefront of, of the research on, on that type of technology. Okay, uh, they, but they, they they accepted to discuss to discuss th that point. So um, this was mostly what I wanted to say. Um, uh, but the issue, maybe uh, even for heterodox economists, is that we don't really have for the moment in my view, the relevant framework to deal with that, okay? And if you, we have many excellent top world-class post-Keynesian economists, but they are still, okay, interested in, in growth, in, in, in stimulating demand. They are taking more and more into account the ecological dimension through stock flow consistent modeling, etc. But still, I don't think it's, 
we have many challenges for tomorrow uh, industrial policy taking it into account the ecological dimension and i'm not pretty sure that our tools even on the heterodox part are really really uh, uh, ready to to work on that to 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 be efficient on, on that issues okay i don't know if we have much time for for questions but uh, maybe if you want to raise one or two questions but yeah let's say two or three questions and more thanks david actually this is more of a comment um because i graduated last year and right now i'm managing a team that's informing our government in the philippines on this exact thing um innovation and industrial strategy and just a, a comment on what you've raised is on that policy making body of the rome f cycle one thing that we've been able to apply was that we've, we've been advocating for a lot of outcome-based um, evaluation of policies because one thing that we noticed was that a lot of the government agencies tend to prioritize on the metrics and the targets and so a lot of the times you tend to lose in prioritizing FDI increases the real outcomes that you want to capture in inclusive economic growth and then the other thing that I wanted to raise was that um, for our strategy, and I think it's also for the one in the UK, is that you're ca calling for a whole of government approach. And this is going a little bit into the political economy side, but one thing that we noticed was that it's hard, and it's a nightmare actually, to push for synergy and convergence across different agencies with different mandates, and how do you properly allocate funding across that? And it's something actually I've been discussing um, extensively is that how do you um, align all those mandates and those policies so that ultimately you know we're going for the same outcome and I feel like with the targets that you have and the kind of agenda that you have I feel like I, um, I think heterodox economics has a lot to say in terms of informing how we formulate and um, assess the implementation of a lot of these policies and agenda that's it